everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday Lunch Seminar, where we invite some speakers, mainly from our AD department, to talk about their work in research. So this week we have Dr. Marchin Zuba, a postdoctoral research associate advised by Megan Duffy since 2021. Uh, his research interests include freshwater ecology, host parasite interactions, climate change ecology, and evolutionary ecology. Martin received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees at the AMU in Poznan, Poland, uh, and was actively involved in research on lake community structure and Daphnia Jura. He also conducted research in Switzerland and Germany on scholarship at the AVAG Aquatic Ecology Institute and IGB Berlin Institute, and has won several best talk and poster prizes in recent years at conferences, including the 2018 World Lake Conference in Japan, and the 2019 Lakes and Reservoirs Hot Spots and Topics in the Mali Conference in Poland. So today we'll hear about Daphnia, the master of trade-offs. And by the end of this talk, we kindly ask that the first question be asked by either a graduate student or a postdoc. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I guess you can hear me well, right? Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so I was getting this presentation ready and I uh, really packed it with a lot of stuff. I was really trying to convince you <laughs> about this statement. And then I realized I went definitely too far. So I had to rearrange it a lot. Um, I'm gonna go through some stuff I did during my PhD, some stuff that I'm currently working on in Meg's lab. I even have some bachelor stuff over here. So there's a lot and it's, uh, all over the place. But I guess scientifically, the most important thing, the take home message that I want to, you to take out of this seminar is that Daphne are cool. <laughs> Try to prove it. Okay, so it's gonna be Daphne centric. So I should start with saying what Daphne are. These are aquatic crustaceans. They're uh, zooplankton. Uh, crustaceans occurring in uh, freshwater habitats or like mostly lakes and ponds. This is how they look like. Here they had with a compound eye. Uh, these two are antennas. They're not limbs, they're antennas. The limbs are over here, and they're used for filtering water and collecting algae, their food. Uh, and then they, then they digest the food over here in this green tube that is their gut. It's green because of the algae and chlorophyll. And then over here you have a brood chamber which uh, in which you can see uh, little Daphnia embryos. In fact, those red dots over here are eyes of the young embryos. They're gonna turn black in probably a couple hours from uh, when the picture is taken. Uh, right, so this is how Daphnia looks like. And uh, it's been studied worldwide in decades now. And that's because not only it's a great model species, but also it's a keystone organism in freshwater habitats. So it's a central point and the food webs in aquatic environments. Uh, so it's a grazer, it's a, it's a first, uh, first level consumer grazing mostly on algae but also on bacteria, depending on the species, better or worse. Uh, and it's a basic food base uh, for uh, planktivorous fish and also in a lot of invertebrate predators. And then it also, of course, has an impact, uh, indirect impact on predatory fish and it has some complex interactions with other parts of uh, lakes, for instance, plants. And um, we're gonna go to it briefly <coughs> later. Um, and so because of its central point in the food webs, it undergoes a lot of stress, variety of stress, uh, related to all those organisms and also some other factors, including uh, temperature fluctuations or parasites. Um, and so these two, factors I'm gonna focus on first, and then we're gonna try to go through some other of those. Um, one more thing uh, that a lot of people know, but uh, probably for most of you, it's gonna be just a quick reminder that Daphnia predom predominantly reproduce asexually. So they produce offspring that is uh, exclusively daughters, and they are genetically a replica of the mother. And they turn into sexual reproduction usually when the uh, environmental conditions deteriorate. So that can be decreasing temperature or increasing temperature. It could be predation 
or it could be uh, increased density, um, water body desiccation, uh, different types of uh, cues that trigger male production, and then after male production, they reproduce sexually, and as an effect, they produce uh, sexual eggs, which are deposited in those uh, chitinous structures called FPPA, and these are diapausing eggs. So they are being released by Daphnia. They usually sink down on the, or they stay, stay at the surface of the water body. Uh, in any case, they are diapausing, so mostly they're deposited in the sediment, and then they emerge when the conditions uh, in the environment improve. Uh, but mostly they are reproducing asexually, which means that there are great model organs for lab experiments because we can use the same, genetically the same organism and apply different uh, conditions to it. So we reduce the uh, variation due to uh, genetic differences between, between our animals. Okay, and so I'm, go, I'm gonna go through uh, several different projects that I had uh, and show you some interesting trade-offs that Daphnia are forced to apply because of different uh, stressors. And I'm gonna start with the uh, project that I did during my PhD program, which was mostly focusing on climate change impact on Daphnia. And so, uh, to start with a little bit of uh, introduction, how is how does temperature, or specifically temperature increase, impact Daphnia? There is something called temperature size rule. And it applies to a lot of ectotherms, not only Daphnia. Uh, what, it, what the temperature size rule describes is that with increasing temperature, the body size of invertebrates decreases. They basically shrink. And it's mostly observed in aquatic uh, or aquatic invertebrates, much more than terrestrial ones. And that is because uh, the resource that drives this shrinkage is quite often oxygen which can be depleted in water bodies, more so than in terrestrial environments. Um, but how does it work? Uh, the temperature size rule is, it had been observed a lot, but the, the theoretical background for it is uh, a little bit vague. There are like several different ways to explain what's happening. I'm gonna show you the one that I find more, most believ believable and also the most frequent. Uh, so. What happens is, for ectotherms, is that with increasing temperature, the metabolic rate of ectotherms increases. And therefore, metabolic costs will also rise with increasing temperature. Now, for simplification, let's split those costs that organism carries into those related to reproduction and those related to growth. If both of those combine, or both of those increase with temperature, then if we combine them, the costs might be really high, and at some point they might, they might exceed the level of resources accessible for, for the animal, either because there is no more resources in, in the environment, or perhaps because uh, the velocity, the, the rate of acquisition and transformation of those resources is just not enough. And then what happens is the animals need to apply a trade-off. So they're gonna have to uh, change the investment of the available resources in order to optimize their uh, life strategy. So what they usually do is they reduce the growth, they invest less in body size in order to maintain a uh, relatively high reproduction rate. That's the uh, theoretical basis for, for temperature size rule. For a lot of uh, invertebrates, it's tricky though, because a lot of them, in the in case of a lot of them, uh, body size is positively correlated with, or reproduction is positively correlated with body size, which means the bigger the organism is, the more babies it can produce. In Daphnia, as you can, could have seen this brood chamber that uh, contains all the babies, the bigger it is, the more babies you can fit in. And so the smaller the Daphnia, the less babies it can fit in. So we can imagine that this temperature size will, will put a constraint onto reproduction. So there is another trade-off that a given Daphne has to, uh, say, consider. It's gonna have to optimize the investment of resources to uh, share them between growth and reproduction to maximize the fitness. And so uh, if we consider this problem in light of uh, global warming, 
it might be it might be an important one because uh, predominantly there is an expectation that with increasing temperature, body size of many ectotherms, especially aquatic ectotherms, will shrink. Uh, the problem is how do you test something that you expect to observe a hundred years from now? Let's say there's almost no ways, but almost. So. What I did during my PhD is I used lakes heated by power plants. So in central Poland, somewhere over here, there's a system of brown coal mines uh, and also power plants placed next to them. And two of those power plants use uh, water from these five lakes over here to cool down energetic flux. So they uptake the water, heat it up, and they dump it back, heat it. So the temperature of those lakes is roughly around three to four degrees higher, especially at the surface in comparison to regular non-heated lakes uh, in the area. And so, conveniently, this difference corresponds to IPCC scenarios for the next 100 years. So that's our climate change simulation. So what was left to do here is um, collect the Daphnia uh, in those heated lakes, compare them to non-heated lakes, and see what this climate change, simulated climate change, did to those Daphnia. Uh, and here's a zoom in into one of the power plants. Uh, and so that's exactly what I did. So I was monitoring those lakes for a couple of years, and I used two year worth of data on body size collected monthly to investigate how, what, how, what is the body size distribution in Daphne in those lakes, and also how it corresponds to their uh, reproduction. So here's my body size results. The expectation, as you uh, hopefully remember, is that Daphne and heat lakes will be smaller because of the uh, increased temperature. What we observed is that there's actually no difference in size between Daphne from heated and control lakes across all the um, temperatures that occur throughout the season. Uh, in fact, there is some trend. It's not significant, but there is some trend over here at like the low temperature range. But it's opposite to one, what one might expect. So Daphne and heat lakes tended to be slightly, but non significantly bigger. There, there is a trend, as I mentioned. Uh, now, that would uh, then uh, indicate that maybe there is no difference in reproduction as well. Well, that would be a wrong assumption. So what we observed is that Daphne and heated lakes generally produce more babies, especially uh, within the range of high and extremely low temperatures they produce more, significantly more than Daphne from control lakes. And all that increases their thermal breadth for reproduction. So it, it broadens the range of temperatures in which they, they can successfully reproduce. Uh, and so that's kind of interesting and uh, a little bit contrary to what I've been expecting. But then you have to keep in mind that it's field measurement. So it's uh, prone to all the other factors that occur in the field. And so in order to eliminate that, uh, well, the solution was simple. Take the Daphnia to the lab, breed them, do the same experiment, uh, do the same measurements in controlled conditions in the lab experiment. So that's what I did. Uh, I collected Daphnia from hidden control lakes. There is a small glitch to it. So uh, those lakes differed, slightly differed in species composition. So in heated lakes, the dominant species is Daphnia galata, and in control lakes, the dominant species Daphnia longispina. Those two species belong to the same species complex, which means they hybridize. They reproduce uh, sexually between one another and produce interspecific hybrids that are fully vi viable, but they are still considered separate species, even though they hybridize. And so I use the two species and compare their body size because we compared them in the field, so that was reasonable. Uh, next step. And so what I observed is that Daphne from Gila Lakes were actually bigger, way bigger than Daphne from Control Lakes, um, regardless of the applied temperature. And I should have mentioned that I run this experiment in three temperatures, 16, 20, and 24 degrees. They were bigger in all, temp in all temperatures. But also, interestingly, Daphne from Gila Lakes were the ones that were reducing their body size in response to increasing temperature. They were shrinking as temperature size will predict. In case of uh, Daphne from cold control lakes, I observed no such body size reduction. Uh, and now, when I compared the reproduction of those Daphne, Daphne from heated lakes were consistently producing more babies regardless of temperature. So even though 
the temperature increase was reducing reproduction of, of both. It didn't re reduce the reproduction of the bigger Daphnia more, even though you would think that they are going to carry more costs uh, related to temperature increase just because they were bigger. So they had more expenditures related to body size maintenance and growth. Uh, they still uh, cope with the temperature, most likely because, th because of this phenotypic plasticity. So they reduce their body size in order to maintain the reproductive advantage uh, as the trade-off would predict if it was efficient. Uh, right. But then again, I was comparing two species, two different species. So that's a problem. So what I did is I ran another experiment in which I compared exactly the same species across three different uh, thermally different environments. So I used, again, Daphnia galata from heated lakes, and I compared it to Daphnia galata from German lakes, which are uh, similar to uh, those control lakes in Poland in case of temperature, in terms of temperature. Uh, so it's, I call it cold control. And then I compare them also to Daphnia collected from Italian lakes. So these are thermally similar to Daphnia, to, sorry, to lakes uh, heated by power plants. So I had those two controls. And again, I compared body size and reproduction of Daphnia in the lab. And so uh, what we see in terms of body size is that Daphnia from heated lakes were significantly larger than Daphnia from cold controls, so from German lakes, but not from Italian lakes. OK, so again, we see the size advantage of Daphnia uh, from heated lakes, or at least bigger size. And then in terms of reproduction, again, we see that Daphnia from heated lakes were producing significantly more babies than Daphnia from German lakes. Not from Italian lakes, though. And so uh, the results are very similar to the previous experiment. So we observed that Daphne from Italy lakes the only, are the only ones who apply body size reduction as a trade-off in order to maintain, maintain the effective reproduction and the re reproductive advantage over the, uh, the other groups of Daphne. And so. Uh, Contrary to what I was expecting to observe, Daphnia from heated lakes were bigger. They're, they basically were inherently growing to, to be bigger and then Daphnia from, from non-heated lakes and from uh, colder environments. But they were also strongly redu reducing their body size in response to temperature elevation. And so I was able to quantify that. And I'm going to try to guide you through these calculations. So on this graph, I'm calculating the constitutive evolution of body size, and then plasticity of body size, and evolution of plasticity. So let's start with plasticity. Plasticity was estimated as like basic plasticity for Daphnia, uh, who I used as a reference. I used the control Daphnia, the cold control Daphnia from Germany, to estimate their plasticity. So essentially, the plasticity in response to temperature increase was uh, estimated as difference in body size in Daphne from cold controls between 20 and 28 degrees. So that's this rate. Then uh, change in body size that is um, assigned to constitutive evolution is essentially difference between Daphne in cold control and heated lakes Daphne, or in this case, in uh, Italian Daphne. So this bar represents the difference between this point and this point, as an evolution of larger size in those heated lakes. And then evolution of plasticity is a difference in the rate of body size reduction in response to temperature increase between Daphnia from uh, cold control and Daphnia from heated lakes, or here, Daphnia from Italian lakes. So what this figure shows you is uh, a counter gradient variation where the evolution um, select for larger, inherently larger body size, but it also supports evolution of body size plasticity uh, or plastic reduction of body size in the case where temperature is increasing uh, and triggers some uh, trade-offs in those Daphnia. And so you can imagine why uh, these Daphnia need to reduce their body size. Uh, or in what conditions they need to reduce their body size. We all already observed it in the field. So uh, they definitely need to reduce their size when the temperature is extremely high 
and becomes very costly. But why would they evolve large size? Of course, because of the opposite. So uh, large size is becoming beneficial, especially in those extremely cold conditions. Why is that? Because there is less of a predation. The predators are less active, so there's lesser cost of being spotted by the predator uh, due to the large body size. There's less resources, so bigger size accounts for better acquisition. And then it also accounts for more effective reproduction and uh, better resistance to starvation in case of Daphnia. And so all these factors contribute to favoring larger body size, and we can actually see a hint of that over here. So what uh, with evolution of, of larger body size support is the active overwintering and thriving during, during cold. Uh, and then the evolution of plasticity is just a measure to counteract heat waves or extremely warm conditions. Uh, that was the temperature. Now I wanted to show you uh, some uh, a project, the one that I'm most excited about while working here, uh, trade-offs and symbiosis. So before I came to the lab, Meg and and uh, and her team discovered this new symbiont of Daphnia that we call MGG. It's a microsporidian that infects uh, guts of Daphnia, creating those white clusters that you can see over here. So essentially. Spores of MGG that you can see over here, when they're suspended with water, they can be consumed by Daphnia. They get into the gut and then they penetrate the gut wall and, um, and stay there and start reproducing. Uh, you can also see some grainy clusters over here. Um, and since they're on, they are microsporidians, you can expect that they might have some negative effects. So microsporidians. Uh, have like very simplified mitochondria, so what they do is usually they hijack host uh, mitochondria and they, they just steal their energy. So we might expect it's, gonna, it's not going to be beneficial for the host. So to test that, we run live table experiment on the lab. Uh, when we used seven clones of Daphnia, we grinded Daphnia infected with MGG to get the spores out, and we exposed newborn Daph or new Daphnia, either 48 uh, hours old or uh, five days old, to those spores, and we are measuring uh, life table parameters, mostly uh, focusing on reproduction. We also, of course, had a control which was not exposed to the parasite. And um, it's, it's not that important now to pay attention to the uh, two-day-old versus five-day-old. We just had a reason to think that the uh, uh, different age um, accounts for different susceptibility. And uh, we had some, some confirmation to that. But uh, let's focus on, on the uh, effect of MGG on the reproduction of those Daphne. So some of the clones, OK, uh, I'm going to briefly tell you what we see on, this, on, on these graphs. So uh, on the y-axis, you have number of newborns produced. And uh, on the x-axis, you have a clutch, which is like a uh, reproduction event for Daphne. So it's, it's a measurement of time in reproductive events. So how Daphne reproduces is that it produces bunches of embryos that releases consecutively every, let's say, three days. So it's like one bunch of babies, two, second bunch of babies, third bunch of babies, and so on. And that's what we see on the x-axis. So we, we see the reproduction of an individual over time, how many babies it produces with every reproduction event. And so we have uh, a control group, which is always blue. And then we have uh, Daphnia that were infected either when exposed uh, to MGG at two days old or five days old. So the two day old is, is <coughs> orange, the five days old is purple. And then on the next graphs, we are going to also have a group called exposed, 120 or exposed 48, which is those Daphnia that were exposed to the parasite but didn't become infected. And so what we see for these two clones of Daphnia is that when they were infected with MGG, they produced much less babies, especially once the infections really developed. Uh, it's pretty late in their lifespan uh, because it's, it's past fourth or fifth clutch that we actually see the effects. And usually in the field, they don't live that long. But generally, you can see that it, it is costly to be infected with MGG. 
However, uh, in other clones, we did not observe any negative effect. So uh, over here in those two clones, you can see the blue line going like through those orange and purple lines. Actually, in this case, uh, it seems that Daphne infected with McGeeu uh, at five days old actually deals better and reproduces better in comparison to control, which is surprising. Not sure what happened there yet. Uh, anyways, you probably observed that, uh, you probably noticed that uh, I'm trying to convince you that McG is the lesser F evil. So huh, how is it possible? Okay, so uh, before I got to the lab, Mary Rogalski and co-authors worked with McG and, uh, and uh, observed that when Daphne uh, infected with McG uh, is exposed to other uh, parasites, the more deadly ones, the obligate killers, uh, the probability of becoming infected with those obligate killers decreases with infection with McG. And in fact, the more infected they are with McG, the, less, uh, the lesser is the probability of getting infected with those uh, more deadly or deadly parasites. This is how uh, one of those parasites looks like, Mechnikovia bicuspidata. It's a needle-shaped, uh, um, like the spores of the parasite are needle-shaped. It's a fungal parasite and kills Daphnia within 10 days from infection. You can also see how it pierces the gut of Daphnia right over here. You can see <coughs> one spore and over there there's another spore piercing the gut. And so uh, when these parasites are in the environment, it suddenly becomes beneficial to be infected with MIG-G. In fact, um, Mary and co-authors uh, checked how the uh, the prevalence of the parasites uh, that are obligate killers um, affects the well, sorry the reproduction of Daphnia depending on whether they are infected with McG or no. So on these figures, you have the relative fecundity of Daphnia infected with McG in, uh, in relation to non-infected Daphnia. So the non-infected Daphnia are the zero points, and uh, if the trend line is above the zero point, it means that the McG infected uh, Daphnia had a reproductive advantage, so they reproduce better than the non infected ones. When it's below, it means they reproduce worse than that. Uh, and it's, it's uh, split into two parasites, so Machnikovia, this fungal parasite, and another obligate parasite, which is uh, Pasteria. Uh, and uh, the left side is Indiana and lakes in, in Indiana, and uh, right side is lakes in, in Michigan. What you can see on three out of four of those graphs is the more of the obligate killer parasite is in the environment, the better it is to be infected with McG. So McG has a protective function uh, against those more virulent, more deadly uh, parasites. Uh, now, how is that? What's the mechanism behind it? We're not sure yet. We're about to test it. Actually, we're starting an experiment next week. But we have an idea uh, for an explanation. So here I'm showing you four pictures of Daphne that are infected with McG, more or less. And each of those pictures shows you the gut of Daphne. And if you take a close look, you can see that not the entire gut is filled with the food content. There is some space over here, or over here, or over here. And so the, the space is created by detaching pertrophic membrane. Pertrophic membrane is a layer, the protective layer that lines the gut of many invert invertebrates, including Daphnia. It ser serves a protection uh, for, for the gut wall, separating the gut content from, from the wall. And so what we observed is when Daphnia get infected with this, uh, quite frequently the pertrophic membrane gets detached, making this space. I'm going to show you on the cross-section photos. Maybe it's, it's going to be better visible. So that's, that's a cross-section throughout through a gut of Daphnia. And here you can see spore clusters of McG. Uh, one, two, three. Um, some of them are embedded in the wall, but what we observed is that once they get more mature, they, they get, uh, they vacuolize towards inside of the gut and then the spores are released. And so here on these cross sections, it's again 
the gut lining, the single cell layer of the gut over here and over there, uh, some MCG spores. And over here, that's a pertrophic membrane, and over here, that's a pertrophic membrane. So you can see a huge cluster, cluster of spores, MCG over here, and it probably pushes the, the pertrophic membrane away from the gut, creating this space that I showed you in pictures before. So what we think is happening is that in case of uh, not infected with MCG dafnia, when the spores of, say, Mechnikovia occur in the, uh, in, the, in the environment and get ingested by Daphnia, they go through the gut and they simply pierce it, going to the hemocell, and then starting to reproduce and proliferate in the host. Uh, but when the pertrophic membrane is detached because of MCG infections, the pertrophic membrane guides the spores through the gut without contact with the, with the gut wall. And that way, it probably reduces the probability of getting pierced with the spores and eventually infected with, with uh, Mechnikovia. Okay, uh, so that's what I'm currently working on now. I wanted to go to migrations. Uh, how much time do I? Uh, okay, we still have some time. Okay, good, 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 good. I'm really worried because I'm, there's a lot. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, Daphnia and uh, a lot of zooplankton performs uh, diurnal migrations. Uh, vertical migrations are very well known. How they work, it's pretty simple. So when zooplankton senses uh, predators in the environment, uh, especially fish predation, they tend to migrate downwards. Why? Because fish hunt using their sight. They spot their, their prey using their eyes. And so if you stay in a well-lighted zone, you're easily spotted. And so knowing that, Daphnia tend to migrate to the darker zone of the lake and stay there until it gets dark. And then they come back up during the night. Uh, where's the trade-off? Uh, it's, it's right over here in this uh, surface zone. Why? Would they go downwards? I told you, but why would they go back up? That is because because of this zone is uh, lighted up during the day. That is where all the algae is. That is where the food content is. Moreover, that's where high temperature is, and that means staying in this zone, they're gonna develop faster, reproduce faster, and they're gonna have much better food quality over there. And so it's beneficial to stay there as long as it's not risky. But most of the time, it is risky. And so they have to go down, and then they go back up. And so being down there, they suffer from cold environment, from lesser oxygen, and more poor food condition. But they do it anyway, because they trade it off for safety. Uh, the problem is when there is no deep water refuge. Uh, so if you have a shallow lake, there is no way to escape into the dark zone. So what they do instead is they migrate towards the vegetation and they hide over there. And then again, that's, that's not without cost. There is another trade-off because in between those trees, there is another danger in the form of invertebrate predators like dragonfly larvae. The plants themselves are also negatively Im impacting the daphnia. And so it's risky, but it's quite frequently worth it. And uh, that's what I investigated during my bachelor studies. I didn't show that to anyone in like 12 years or so, so <laughs> pretty old. Um, so what I did there is I went to one of the shallow lakes in Poznan, where I come from, and I placed those traps. The traps are pretty simple, so they are funnels placed in those um, little water containers. And the set of those traps was placed in front of the vegetation uh, facing towards open water and facing towards uh, vegetation. So they're essentially catching uh, everything that migrates from the open water into the vegetation and backwards. And what I observed is that, and that's, that was also quite surprising. So during the nighttime, I observed a lot of animals migrating from the vegetation into the open water, which is what we would expect by horizontal migrations, right? 
it's getting more safe in the open world during the night, that's where they go. However, during the day, I saw very little organisms migrating, very few organisms migrating from the open world into the vegetation, and also from the vegetation into the open world. So where do they go? Okay, the explanation is pretty simple and it's essentially my mistake. So what happens is like during the night, as I said, uh, the organs migrate from, uh, from the vegetation into the open water. They don't care about the death, death. But during the day, they actually go underneath the trap. So my trap was placed right below the surface and I left some space between the trap and the sediment. And so what they did is they did just essentially went below the trap. They avoided the trap. And why would they do that? That's pretty simple. Because they're not smart enough to know what kind of lake they're in. Essentially what they do is when the light comes up, they go down, they're looking for this deep water refuge, but they cannot find them. So they're going to go along the bottom in order to find some shade eventually. And they find it in between the plants and that's what they stay because they're shaded it's just yeah I was not aware of that that it's not left and right it's it's going in circles so yeah there is that and uh, okay we still have some time so I'm gonna guide you over some simple anti-predator mechanisms that uh, Daphne applied that I think are uh, just amazing very impressive so they can adapt their life history uh, depending on what type of predator is in the environment. So if we split them, uh, the predators into two groups, you're going to end up with planktivorous fish and invertebrate predators. And there is a significant difference between the two of them. The difference is that these guys don't care about the size of the uh, prey. In fact, they do because the, better, the bigger the size, the better because it's more efficient to prey on the bigger uh, bigger prey, whereas these guys, invertebrate predators, are usually gape limited, which means they can only eat whatever fits in their mouth. And so the adaptations towards those two kinds of predators will be vastly different. So life history adaptations are like this. When there's a lot of planktivorous fish, Daphnia tend to grow smaller. They produce a lot of babies, but of smaller size, in order to be less visible for fish. Contrary, when there is invertebrate predators, Daphnia tend to invest more in body size and they pr produce less embryos, but the embryos are bigger. They are as big as possible and then delay the birth in order to reduce the time between the birth and uh, the offspring getting out of the range of the predator. So, and it's all triggered within, the one, gen within one generation. Uh, totally different mechanisms of reproduction, different strategies. And then there is a lot of morphological adaptations, starting from neck teeth that just make it harder for the invertebrate predator to catch the prey and ingest it. Then you have a variety of helmets and tail spines that are just preventing uh, the, uh, the Daphne from being grabbed. They even, like one of the species, Daphne longicephala, produces this giant head to be more difficult to, to ingest. Then Daphnia can also produce hemoglobin. And uh, I know what you think, it's producing hemoglobin is probably not an anti-predator adaptation. And you're right, it's not. It's like in humans, it's to improve the assimilation and distribution of oxygen throughout the body. The thing is, uh, as beneficial as it is, it makes you all red. And so that makes you more visible. So Seizing the production of hemoglobin is the adaptation to high predation. So the hemoglobin is synthesized by Daphnia only when it's safe in the, in the environment. The, preda the predation is relatively low or none. And so, and usually in these conditions, Daphnia beginning to crowd each other and so they deplete the oxygen and that's when the hemoglobin starts being very useful. Or uh, if the predation is intensive, but you have deep water refuge, you can go there, but then you're gonna face uh, oxygen shortage because it's a deep water refuge. So the solubility of the oxygen, well, yeah, the, the oxygen concentrations will be quite low. Uh, and then Daphnia that stay uh, 
in those deploy refuge, quite refuges, uh, quite frequently they do produce, they synthesize hemoglobin as well, just to make it possible for them to stay down there. Uh, and they can also uh, produce a form of UV protection. So uh, in um, Arctic uh, water bodies or alpine water bodies, they are quite frequently exposed to intensive UV radiation. And so they make the carapaces black in order to reduce the UV uh, impact, UV damages. And uh, of course, when the probability of predation increases, it's not good to be as visible as this Daphnia would be in a clear alpine lake. And so they stop producing this, this protection. And instead, they usually go deeper to the water body if it's possible. Um, OK. Uh, I wanted to thank you with that, but you see I have a little bit more time. So I can go to stuff that I pushed back, if that's OK with you. OK, so I have two things. One is my project, but it might take too much time. So I'm going to show you one of my favorite papers. That's the stuff that I did during my PhD. But let's, let's go through that. And I wanted to show you this, because I'm very excited about this old paper from 86. <laughs> so remember how I told you about the vertical migrations, right? very effective and, and very popular uh, way of avoiding predation among zooplankton. This study shows that it might be a trap. So <laughs> Professor Givic uh, was studying zooplankton in Lake Horabas in Mozambique. You can see this like over here. It's surrounded by high, uh, quite steep mountains. And so what they observed is like fluctuations of each of the zooplankton species that we, they were studying. You can see rises and drops uh, over time. And they couldn't figure out why that is until they overlap those data to lunar cycle. Weird, right? So <laughs> here is the thing. Daphnia essentially were migrating downwards in that lake and then migrating backwards, uh, upwards again, and thriving in those surface waters feeding and all that. And the fish were, the fish in those lakes were kind of starving until once a month when the full moon rise, and it didn't rise immediately after the darkness because of the mountains. So a couple hours after the darkness, the moon would rise above the, the mountains and shed a light on the reservoir. And that's where, when the fish would wipe out all the zooplankton population. So they, they were starving throughout the month, every month, and waiting for this one night <laughs> with a full moon to get really well fed. And they actually confirmed it by, by opening the guts of the fish and checking the, the numbers. So it's, yeah, that's what it was. Uh, OK, and with that cool research, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs> Right, so um, the first thing we're going to do, like it's, it's going to be a process, and we're definitely not going to answer all the questions in this experiment that's coming. But what we're planning to do is we're going to uh, infect Daphne with McG in the lab and expose them to those MEG spores. And then we're going to measure the detachment of the pertrophic membrane and uh, align it into the number of spores that were piercing through the gut, the, the number of those that actually penetrate into the human cell. And then we're going to compare it also to the prevalence of infection with match, depending on the, yeah, the intensity of, of all the previous measurements. Yeah, that's, that's our plan. Yes? I appreciate that you mentioned the natural history of these, so thanks for that. <laughs> that was really cool. um, my question would be, how are they, are the Daphnia, assessing density of type of predators of Okay, uh, so um, I'm not exactly sure about everything, but uh, it's definitely chemo reception. So uh, both fish and invertebrates produce dif like different sets of chemicals that are characteristic to them. And so what is frequently done in 
an experiment with Daphnia uh, in order to induce those like morphological changes on behavioral changes is that you would say incubate the uh, fish in the water that you further use in the experiment. So you put the fish for a day or two and you later filter that water but it still has the fish scent. It's probably fish exudates plus bacteria that feed on them that further like release some chemicals. And then you give that to Daphnia, and that induces the morphological changes. And same with invertebrate predators. You can like either incubate them or crush them into the water, and that, that itself triggers. So they, they have some chemoreception of those, of those uh, cues. They're called chiromones, too. Could you repeat the second one, please? Yeah. Do you think the parasites may impair the food assimilation? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. I'm going to start with the second one, and if I forgot about the first one, please remind me. Uh, so, uh, yes, that's what we think is the trade-off in um, in this MGG uh, Machnikovia or MGG morvillian parasite situation. So, uh, the if the MGG triggers the detachment of hypertrophic membranes. It's going to be beneficial when the uh, virulent parasites are there, but also it definitely impairs the food assimilation. So it, one thing is that it reduces the uh, gut lumen volume, which means like less food will uh, fit in there. It probably also reduces the retention of the food in the gut, so it reduces the, the rate at which it's being digested, uh, and probably also reduces the assimilation surface uh, of the nutrients that are uh, released in those guts. So yes, for sure, I agree with, with that, um, that assumption or idea. Uh, and then the first question was whether um, the size differences uh, or the bigger size in those heated lakes could have been attributed to other factors than, than just the temperature. Uh, I get that question a lot, and I really struggled to publish that paper because of that. Because uh, what you usually get uh, when you observe the differences in size, body size, uh, in zooplankton is predation, definitely predation. And it's fair because predation really strongly affects body size. So fish would select towards smaller body size, invertebrate predators would select for larger body size. So my answer to the reviewers when I was trying to publish this paper is that when you get warmer conditions, in the environment, when the temperature rises, you definitely are going to get more intensive predation. There are some studies done on the fish in those lakes, and it's definitely that there is uh, more fish, more planktivorous fish, and also their activity and then uh, the, their predation is also uh, intensified, which is uh, quite natural because, like, again, they're ectotherms. The higher the temperature, the higher the metabolic rate of the fish. So it needs more resources, more food to keep themselves sustained. And so uh, I doubt that the predation would favor larger body size in those lakes. Whether it could be other factors, I'm not sure. I measured chemical parameters of the water. They have no effect. Maybe there is something else that could boost it. The most accurate uh, answer I can give to this is that I really spend a lot of time comparing those lakes. And what, I'm, what I am aware of is that there's more differences than just temperature, but all the differences there are are due to temperature. So there are going to be direct and indirect effects of the temperature. And that's one of the brilliance of the system, because you can't recreate that stuff in the lab, uh, because you're going to get the long-term effects of increased temperature and also both direct and indirect effects of the temperature. So those, those effects uh, of temperature that regulate hydrology, those that affect the development of fish, of, of vegetation, 
of uh, changes of chemical parameters, it all stems from the increase in temperature. So whether there are some other factors that contribute to that, that I, I cannot think of right now, I'm still pretty convinced they're going to be related to temperature as indirect effects. Okay, so all experiments I've done uh, on those Daphnia were, they looked like this. I kept Daphnia, uh, experimental Daphnia in 20 uh, degrees Celsius, and then I would harvest the offspring, and the offspring would be the experimental animals, and then I would put them uh, into the respective temperatures. And so it occurred within a single generation, yes. Sorry, for the second experiment, when I have 20 and 24, and then 28 degrees, I, had, I kept them in, if I remember correctly, I kept them in 24 degrees before the experiment, and I split them, so one batch would have four degrees more, one batch would have four degrees less. Uh, but it all occurs in, in a single generation. Yeah. Does the plants have a negative effect on Yes. Oh, sure. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> one thing, I'm laughing because I had this discussion with Chris over here. Um, okay, so uh, one thing is that plants are a um, good environment for invertebrate pets, or so there is that. But also plants tend to produce uh, alkaloids. They're, like, they have strong allelopathic impact on both uh, uh, insect larvae and also zooplankton. So they're repellent. Another thing is that this, allo this allelopathy uh, is probably mostly targeted to algae. And so there's going to be less algae in between those plants. And so the food is of a lesser quality. So as long as they're there, they don't get as good food over there. Uh, is there anything else that I can think of? Oh, something else. Never mind, but yeah, for sure, for sure, the, so the, the food, uh, the chemicals that are like negatively impacting them and uh, extra, extra predators. Oh, and then there are also some aquatic uh, carnivorous plants. Uh, so you can also have those, that's extra, extra factor. Uh, yes. <laughs> That's a good question. I was actually thinking if I should start with that. So, <laughs> fun stuff. Uh, a lot of you, um, at least I assume, were going to become scientists or researchers when you were in high school or maybe shortly after that. I was supposed to be a soccer player. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work out. Uh, <laughs> but so then I, I went to college, studied environmental protection, and uh, during, I think, second semester of my bachelor's studies, I had a hydrobiology class. And I think on, during my first class, I uh, had a microscopy work, and I got a slide with living Daphnia Magna. And I looked at it, and I fell in love. And so <laughs> I'm here now. <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> I guess thank you so much for your <laughs>